huge audience also on Zoom. So we really do have quite a turnout for our awesome alumna, Ayana Gray. And so what I'm gonna do is just say a few words about Ayana's career at the University of Arkansas. And then I'm gonna have her professor, Jeff Ryan, introduce her. And what I love about this audience, looking around, I see all the different groups represented that I, Ayana engaged with intensely during her four years here. The Department of Political Science. Sorry, wave your hand. Come on, political science. <laughs> the Multicultural Center. Representatives for the Multicultural Center. We also have African and African American Studies, including the director in the back, Dr. Kari Bantan. <laughs> Ayana cited her trip to Ghana with AAST is massively transformative. And from University of Advancement, I know you didn't think I remember. <laughs> Ayana worked in University of Advancement because her writing skills, that's why we're here, were so phenomenal <laughs> that she came highly recommended by now Chancellor Charles Hopkinson. So I think I see Deb Ugolano in the back, am I right? 
Charles Robinson today, our chancellor, and he reminded me that he had personally recruited Ayana from Little Rock because she was thinking about strongly going to another school of the left in a different <laughs> city in the south. But luckily, Charles drew upon his, you know, compelling skills and actually landed her what I hope was an extraordinary experience for four years. So the Honors College Mike program, we recognize awesome faculty on campus, rock star alumni, and also other potentates from the state of Arkansas. <laughs> so this is our lecture series, and we're super stoked to represent an amazing alumna of the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, Honors Program, Honors Political Science, AAST, multidisciplinary, super engaged. But I call upon Professor Jeff Ryan, who taught Ayanna Gray an informative honors colloquium in the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences on political violence. And it was, I think, the sort of seedbed for this amazing book. How many of you have got a copy in your hands? Hold it up. Peace of Gray, <laughs> New York Times bestseller, Netflix deal. So I would like to turn the floor over to my colleague, who's not a maniac, but a Boston native, Dr. Jeff Ryan from the Department of Political Science. Take away, Jeff. She said, okay, thank you. Uh, I really do actually want to take off on, um, on doing some of these remarks uh, uh, about a, an amazing person. Um, uh, I need to kind of throw a little bit of inside the, the old man walls uh, uh, jargon at you. Uh, and that is the course that Linda referred to in the uh, I was a fine outstanding graduate of is called Political Violence. It's an honest colloquium called Political Violence, uh, but it's long since been shortened to polio. Uh, and there's a very kind of important nomenclature that attaches here. The course itself, polio, is with a capital P, but all the people who finish the course, aka Ayana, uh, remains lifelong a polio with a small p. So uh, you not can say you know directly, and there are several others I won't name scattered in the audience, but you know, polio. Um, <clears throat> and the process of becoming a polio is actually, uh, it's one I've been, I should point out, I've been teaching this course in a variety of different sort of formats and philosophical approaches for probably more than 25 years. Um, and so it's, it's been a long time kind of evolving. Uh, but ever since the beginning, one of the things I do on the very first day of class, especially as it got smaller and more intense is to tell the students in there that I want it to be one of the most important courses that they take, um, but that in order for that to happen, they have to basically jump into the deep end with both feet, not knowing what lays at the bottom of the pool. And um, I do this for a host of reasons, but not the least of which is sort of fairness and advertising. I mean, we look at some very, very terrible things, things that really make you question your belief in humanity, like um, the use of children in warfare or uh, rape as a tactic of war, um, disappearance and torture, things that normally, that normal, frankly, human beings look away from that we are, you know, we have a little bit of a rubbernecking tendency, I think, that we want to see, we want to look at something that's out of the ordinary. We don't necessarily want to see blood and guts. We don't want to see what I call violence porn, uh, which is the gratuitous kind of display, either in words or in pictures, of the consequences of violence. Um, and yet to study this in the kind of way that I think we all hope is, is possible is to 
Agree to leave your eyes open. Agree not to look away. And that takes a certain amount of courage. Um, and I ask that of uh, new incoming polios every semester. And I say, listen, this is not for everybody. This is something that you don't have to do. And if you have any questions about your mental health or how this might impact that, then I strongly urge you to reconsider. And certainly I won't, and I don't think anybody in my right mind would think any less of you for doing that. And to date, um, I don't recall a single individual that came the first week and wasn't there the second. Um, and to that, and for that, I'm extraordinarily grateful um, because that means that students were all in. Students were willing to um, impose a certain mental cost on themselves that they didn't have to in order for a deeper kind of understanding of the sort of themes that Ayana's uh, book uh, deals with. Things like, you mentioned good and evil, and whether or not monsters exist in the real world. And these are the sort of, this is our bread and butter every week, every Wednesday, it seems, every Wednesday afternoon in the same departmental library that we've held it for a number of years, we deal with these things in a, in a I think, thoughtful and thought-provoking way. Um, and I have learned way more than I have a human right to expect. Um, I learn every semester, every week from my students. Um, I think infinitely more than they learn from me. Um, that they're gracious and say otherwise. <laughs> um, uh, and so, you know, it doesn't, frankly, surprise me that Ayana has gone on to achieve what she has, but it does fill my heart with immeasurable joy. Um, just real, true, unfettered happiness that someone so lovely, so nice, uh, so deserving, um, would, would be able to kind of reap the benefits of all that she's invested up to. And so uh, she's a credit to, uh, to us as, uh, as uh, affiliates or, or participants in the honors program in Florida College, in the university. Um, and indeed, uh, I think you're a definite credit to your, your generation. I think you go on to be, I know. So. <laughs> I'm good at one thing, one thing, one thing, other people embarrassed. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I think it's it's uh, it's a marvelous thing, marvelous for students that are here right now to see that this is not this is not something that happens to somebody who's you know ancient like me. This happens to their peers, and and that. Um, that you know, nothing is beyond you if you if you commit to it. And so um, the pride I feel, the happiness I feel is really kind of overflowing. I've been on edge for weeks now since I found out that, that uh, Ayana was coming back for a visit. So I hope you'll join with me in welcoming um, one of our very best and brightest and sweetest um, success stories among many. Uh, I give you my honor. <laughs> Hello, can you all hear me? Good. Okay, so some mornings before I start. Um, my parents are from New York. Um, and they, in addition to talking like this, um, that's important because they, uh, they talk with their hands. And so because I was raised by New Yorkers, I also talk with my hands. So I promise that I can talk with my arms. It's just how I get nerves out. Um, I'm also going to be brutally honest, um, probably tell jokes, uh, and kind of go all over the place because that's me. Um, so I was thinking about how to start this and kind of, you know, different, different ideas came to mind. And then I thought I'll start with, uh, not quoting, but I'll start by referencing one of my favorite comedians, Steve Harvey. Um, that's, that's not how you normally would start a lecture, I realize, but, um, I love stand-up comedy and I love Steve Harvey, um, short, 
you know, shortcomings forgiven. Um, but he once in a stand up comedy uh, routine that he was doing was talking about how, as a comedian, he has a third eye. And this third eye allows him to see the humor in everything. And I thought that was really, that really struck me because as a writer, I tend to, to I think, see the story in everything. Um, so I have not been back to campus, not for any particular reason, but I've not been back to campus in about six years, um, just because life happens. And so um, coming back to Fayetteville and coming back to campus has kind of been like rereading chapters of, of a diary or of a story that I remember from years ago, but it's, it, it's, it's weird and it's cool and it's emotional um, walking by you know, the union and I can taste the rock star energy drink that I just like. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can do that. Um, and I can, you know, hear my sorority sisters and, and the step practice and, and the strolls that we did out in the Arkansas Union. And uh, it's, it's so vivid. Um, and I, I just, I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Kuhn. Thank you. Where did Dr. Kuhn go? Dr. Ryan. <laughs> um, to Dr. Ryan, to Fulbright, to the Honors Program, just for having me here. Um, Dr. Kuhn, when you, when you invited me to come, I sort of had two emotions. So first I was like, wow, the University of Arkansas wants me to come back and speak, wow. And then after that, joy was dread. Because <laughs> um, I was like, wow, the University of Arkansas wants me to come back and speak and wow. Um, and there was, this, there was this dread and this fear because um, I'm what scientists and scholars would call um, the academic term is who. Um, and what is so? What is a goop? Okay, I'm someone who still eats Lucky Charms cereal for breakfast. Uh, taxes are something that are big and scary to me still. Um, I don't want to change a tire. Um, I rely heavily on Google Maps and do not have any sort of directional ability at all. Um, I still call my mom and dad for just about everything. Um, so in a lot of ways, I sometimes, you know, I'm 28 and I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing. But then I thought, okay, maybe that's something to lean into, you know, <laughs> and maybe being honest about that is, is a good way to start. So, you know, what I wanted to do was tell you all kind of a bit of my story because I'm a writer and everything is a story with me um, in the hopes that maybe by being very honest about the, the trips and the falls and the stumbles and also the leaps and the joy um, maybe that that resonates with you, maybe that's a part of your story, um, or that perhaps in some way it validates, you know, that it's okay, whatever chapter of your story that you're in. So, um, needless to say, I love books. Um, I always have, um, and I used to love to draw books, so I didn't actually use any words. I used to draw illustrations, staple them together, and present them to my parents and say, what do you think? And they'd say, oh, this is beautiful. We see here that this is happening and five-year-old no, 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 that's not what's happening. I get frustrated. So I realized, okay, you need words. <laughs> In order for people to understand what you're trying to say, you need words. And that's really how I got into writing uh, originally, um, probably age six, seven. Um, as a kid, you know, writing was wish fulfillment, writing was copying the people and the creatives that I admired. Um, and I think, you know, I thought of authors as this kind of these elusive people that did a cool, had a cool job, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily think that I could be one. It felt like a pipe dream. Um, I also grew up pretty staunchly middle class. So that meant that my lovely parents were like, we're going to go to private school and you're going to go to college and you're going to our house. Um, <laughs> lovingly. Um, but that was that was something as a young as a child, especially as a young black girl, that you know was impressed upon me. You need to be able to be self-sufficient, look after yourself. And that was important to me. I'm the oldest of my family, so that was also kind of in the DNA. Um, so I always wrote and I always loved creative arts, but it was like even at a young age, I understood. This can't be your job. You need to do something else. So what else do you like, Ayana? Um, eventually, kind of as I got into high school, um, I just I settled on criminal justice, really social justice. I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. Lawyers make good money. It's a respected <coughs> profession in society, a consistent paycheck. And as an added bonus, you know, I, I get to be something of, you know, I think a, a champion for people and that feels good and that was important to me to do a job that felt good I could go home every night and, and feel good about that um 
And then, so I came to University of Arts and Creative Writing major originally, but then I had really awesome political science department classes and switched. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to green writing. Um, and then um, I also had, so um, Dr. King mentioned that Dr. Ross was one of the reasons I was here, um, and he recruited me and called me up and said, I, I think you should come to the UTUA. Um, so I picked up um, African and African American studies as well because of Dr. Robinson. And there's more to that, but um, this plan was still to be a lawyer. And specifically, civil rights or immigration law was what I was interested in. I felt like those were areas of, that, where there were people who needed people who needed a, a champion and advocate. Um, and that's what I set out to do. And then I got to sophomore year of college and realized that the US justice system uh, is shockingly not as clean cut as I thought. Um, and it's rather messy. And it turns out that the bad guys don't always you know, get their due and the good guys don't always get their due. And I started to feel uncomfortable with it. And this is no slight to, to people who work in law, but I knew myself well enough to know that this is not going to work. And it's better that you're honest with yourself about that now. Um, then going all the way through the getting your JD, you know, taking the bar and then realizing this is not what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So it was awkward because uh, I had these two degrees and I was halfway through doing. And for a career that ultimately I knew in my heart I wasn't going to do. So it was too late to switch. Um, so I said, I'll stick it out. Um, junior year came along and a number of things, really important things happened in my junior year. And I know that one of them has already been alluded to. Um, Dr. Ryan, I, I wish I could remember exactly how you, Dr. Ryan, told me about polio. I feel like it was a real, it was, a, it was somewhat of a secret sort of thing, like there's this class, and no one knows about it, you can't register for it. <laughs> so, I was like, okay. Um, and it, it's on Wednesdays, and you know, you, Dr. Ryan mentioned, I got to visit, not polio, but polio's cousin class, Shackboots today. Um, and I went to this class with nine of, nine of my classmates, and we could not have been more different people. Nine of us from totally different walks of life walked into this classroom, not sure what to expect. And I, I mean, even now, if you were to ask each of us, what's polio? What's it like? It's hard to describe what it was like. Um, we'd walk in, ch chatter, you know, talking, talking, and upbeat, <laughs> and we'd leave heavy, like, you know, feeling so, like, just deep in thought as we grappled with, as Dr. Ryan mentioned, really heavy topics, and, you know, you'd walk in saying, there's no just, there's no justification for terrorism, there's no justification for war crimes, and you'd walk out, like, maybe there is, <laughs> oh, I'm a bad person, like, um, but that, but at core, when I kind of, when I try to, you know, wrap my arms around what polio did for me, um, in addition to kind of giving me a lot of empathy for different walks of life, what it did was it made me understand that my idea of good and evil, as I'd understood it my entire 18, 19 years of life, was not nearly as simple as I thought. And that was disturbing um, because you have these core things about who you are and you build off of that core. And then to realize that your core is flawed is, um, is rough. And I realized, you know, that really the people who hold power have a lot of control over what we call good, what we call evil, who we call terrorists, who we call heroes. Um, and there's always another story. And that stayed with me. And then, and this is just this is the way stories work, um, just a few months after polio ended, um, Dr. Calvin White uh, had invited me to, to study abroad in Ghana. He takes a group of students every other year, although now probably not, but typically he would take uh, every other year to Ghana. Ghana is a relatively small country in West Africa. Um, and I really commend Dr. White because what he did, you know, in a lot of study abroad programs, you have um, a sister school and you basically just switch and you spend time on that campus and that's it. Dr. White was really insistent, um, and Dr. Jim Gigantino went with us as well, um, but he was really insistent that we went, you know, and we weren't these privileged Americans hanging out in this very privileged setting within Ghana. As a result, we got to Accra, the capital, and we didn't spend more than two nights in a single part of Ghana. So we arrived in the city, we saw the capital, and then it was off on a bus um, to the next place. Ghana is a really interesting country, um, specifically within Africa, because it's a major, it was a major port for the transatlantic slave trade. And that's one of the things we were studying. 
a lot of people think that African Americans um, all came from West Africa. In reality, slaves were taken from all over Africa, regardless of their ethnicities, regardless of their affiliated tribes, and they were brought to a central location in Ghana. There are, there are still places where you can see in the rocks where they dug out um, kind of trucks where they um, were fed and given water on the tip of the Sahara Desert. And from there, they traveled on foot all the way down to the coast of, of Ghana to some of the slave castles that were occupied by the Portuguese, by the English, and they were kept in those castles until it was time to send them to the Americas. And so we traced that, that passage, and that was part of the experience. Um, and as an African-American woman, again, it's hard to put into words what that experience was like. Um, I love research. I love genealogy. And so I had made the effort to you know, try to find my family and try to you know, learn more about where my family had come from. Um, six generations either way. That's as far as I got for any side of my family. And there's a definitive stopping point. And it's domestic servants and it's slaves and their records are kept next to the records of the pigs and the cattle that were part of the estate. Um, I, I shouldn't joke about it because it's dark humor, but I, I am, uh, as far as I know, related, loosely related to, um, I say Dr. Strange. Um, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, his family owned most of the slaves in Barbados. And um, I you know, was tracing and, and learned that um, one, of, one of my ancestors was named Mabel Cumberbatch and uh, that she was part of his family's estate. Um, but I say that to say like, there's a definitive stopping point where I just can't go all the way back to the African continent. And so going to Ghana and getting that close and seeing the door of no return, which is an archway where slaves literally walked through and that was it. They, they walked across the sand, you know, their feet probably touched, touched the sea and that was it. And, they, and I vividly think about, you know, my ancestors being on those boats and I wonder, did they know? Did they understand? Did they know that hundreds of years later, they were not going to ever come home? Their grandchildren would never come home. Their great, 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 great grandchildren, they were never coming home. And it was just, it was an incredibly emotional experience um, to see blackness and nuance, to see rich black people, to see the Ashanti king decked in gold, to see his palace, to see power in a way that I've never seen before with blackness, to also see extreme poverty, to see villages with no electricity, to see to meet people who don't, didn't know their birthday because there was no record, no kind of birth certificate, but also to see parliament and it's everyone in the parliament was black and they were running a government efficiently. Um, and so all of this was happening. It happened within a month. And I, it felt magical. It felt there was an immense power. And I, as a writer, it's like, there's a story. There are stories, plural here. And I write fantasy because I love magic. Um, and so between political, political violence and this trip to Ghana, um, they were both coming in my head. Uh, but again, I was like, you have to figure out what you're going to do with your life. You don't have time to write. Um, and so I graduated and I moved back home. And I remember, um, so May 2015, I moved back home to Little Rock and I was sitting in my room, boxes everywhere. And I just remember feeling this immense sense of failure. I mean, there's no other word for it, just complete failure. Dr. Ryan, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Perry, um, all of these, these wonderful people who had believed in me. Um, I felt like I let them down because what am I doing? I'm back home. I don't have a plan. My friends are literally off getting med you know, MDs, going to law school, traveling the world, getting PhDs, and I'm at home. And I, I really was like, did I just screw everything up? Did I just waste all of the scholarship dollars that I that I worked for? And um, you know, I did the mature thing, of course, and I retreated back to what I knew, and I knew books and I knew stories, and I found comfort in, in that world. At a time of my life when I couldn't control very much, I could control the stories that I was writing. So I started writing. And I didn't know what I was going to write. I had ideas. I wanted to write about good and evil. I wanted to write a world that was that, that borrowed from Ghana and the beauty that I saw in Ghana, the lush jungles, the thriving cities, the beautiful deserts and forests. Um, and I wanted to bring it all together because I'd never seen a book like that at the library. I'd never seen a book like that at the bookstore. And Tenny Morrison, I'm paraphrasing, but she, she said, if you don't see the book you're looking for, you must write it. Mm -hmm. So I wrote what I wanted to see. 
Um, it took four years, and I, I try to repeat and tell people that as often as I can. It took me four years, and I didn't sit down every day with a typewriter. I would have known a typewriter, um, <laughs> uh, you know, by the candlelight. I, it was not that beautiful. It was um, me also, you know, trying to become a professional. I worked in university advancement. Um, and really enjoyed getting to do research. I interned in college as an advancement, um, trying to kind of find my, my spot there. I did the mature thing and did a backwards gap year. So after I got a you know steady job and then decided to quit that job and go study abroad, much to my not study live abroad, much to my parents' uh, joy. <laughs> really, really happy about the one way ticket to Australia. Um, <laughs> you know, so I say all, like life was happening. Um, while I was kind of writing on the side, and it was this, this thing that I didn't tell anybody about, um, but it made me happy. And at the time, I was like, you know, I don't know if I'll finish this. I don't, I certainly don't think anything will come of it, but it makes me happy. Um, and so I was working on it, and for four years, that was it, while, while life was happening. Um, and then I got back from Australia, and it was like, okay, I got it. You had your fun, older, you know, oldest kid, you know, DNA picking in, like, you have to find a job and you have to find a job that's not going to give your parents blood pressure, you know, spike it. Um, so I decided to go back into advancement and advancement is, is fundraising at that essence, fundraising for all the things that do to as a cover. So most things. Um, so I worked for the enemy and I worked for the University of Florida. Um, it wasn't as pretty as they had built. Um, so, you know, it was, it was a strange thing though. No one tells you in your 20s how hard it is to make friends. Up until you're 22, 23, you have school, you have a natural community to find people your age that can relate to what's happening in your life. You turn 25 and some people have kids and some people are married and some people are in jail and you're like, I don't know how to do this. Um, so I moved to this new town and I didn't know anybody. And so again, you know, this lack of control and feeling like, what do I do? I turned to what I did know, writing. And it turned out that there was this really um, quite um, quite abundant writing community on Twitter of all places. And I found people, I started to connect with people for the first time in my life who liked what I liked, you know? Um, I skipped the details of awkward Ayana's like, you know, preteen years, but I was an awkward little kid. Um, I like weird things and would like lecture people about triceratops when I was little, <laughs> that was normal, um, you know? So it, as a kid, it was hard to find people that I could relate to. And so suddenly at 25, there were lots of people I could relate to. People who liked books, people who understood my obscure references, people who were interested in prose. And um, I learned about an event on Twitter of all places called um, DB Pitt. And DB Pitt was created by a literary agent named Beth Phelan, specifically for marginalized creators, people of different ethnicities and races, um, writers in the LGBTQ plus community disabled writers, um, really any writers that because of their marginalization were traditionally kept out of publishing. And you pitch your book idea by a tweet um, and, and kind of see what happens. And if an agent liked your tweet, that meant send me your stuff. So it was kind of a way to get around the, the traditional query process. So it was the first time in my life that I had a deadline for my work. Um, I said, I have to finish my this book that I've been writing on for writing for four years, I have to do it by this date or I can't participate in this program. So I did. I finished, you know, April 2019. So you're doing the math, this is four years already. Um, and I was so, so nervous. I was so nervous that I took off of work and I put Beachella on. I realized not everybody knows what Beachella is. Beachella is a legendary performance by the Beyonce Knowles Carter, um, <laughs> where she um, she performed at Coachella. And it was it was amazing. But she's such a powerful, confident figure, at least she presents that way. So I watched that all day. I tweeted and watched Beachella all day long. <laughs> and finally, a friend texted me. She said, Have you been on Twitter today? I said, No. She said, You might want to check. Um, I had hoped that one literary agent would see my tweet and maybe have an interest. Um, I pitched my story as um, Black Arya Stark meets King of Scars with a little pitch about the story. And I just hoped for one. Um, in the end, about 50 agents ended up liking it, <laughs> like physically liking the tweet. Um, and it turns out that if your tweet gains enough traction, it actually starts to hide the likes. You can't see everybody, so I was 
completely panicked. Um, but among those different names, there was um, a gentleman named Keith Mapp, who I knew was a really um, fantastic children's literature agent. He represented authors who I admired and just had a lot of respect within publishing. Um, and he, he asked to see the material. So I panicked. Um, there's a lot of panicking in this story. <laughs> and I said, I can't send it to Pete Knapp. Um, I can't send it. It's not ready. I waited a whole month. And I think there's a lesson in that. Um, I think the world often tries to, to push, push people to do things quicker than they're ready to. Um, I know there are people who are doing better send it to him soon. He's not going to lose interest. Um, and something told me not to do that. Something told me to wait um, and to better to be late and great. Um, or fashionably late, whatever you prefer. Um, and I waited. So I waited exactly one month and I sent him the materials. Uh, I pressed send on the email, went to call my then fiance. And before I could dial to call him, I had an email in my inbox and it was Pete saying, Hey, I'd like the rest of the material. Um, more panicking. So I sent it to him and, and kind of, uh, and then lived in panic for the next few weeks. Um, and in the end, Pete ended up. Um, Offering representation, the way that traditional publication works is you need a literary agent to represent you so that they can they take your work off to editors. Otherwise, editors would receive literally hundreds of thousands of stories per year. So that's a way to streamline it. Um, and Pete said, Ayana, I really like this story. It's ambitious. Um, I really like it. It's ambitious. I want to work with you on it before we take it to editors. I said, okay. Um, so we ended up working on it together for a year with the plan to send it to editors in spring 2020. Yeah, <laughs> that's not um, there's a me. Um, that's what I think the youth calls the pandemic. So that's what I'm gonna say. Um, <laughs> so we get to, you know, we were supposed to send it to editors, and in the end, the pandemic threw publishing for a loop because creative arts are the first thing to die when there's any kind of economic crisis. And I said to Pete, you no, know, I don't think we should send this to editors. I, I actually don't think anyone's gonna want this weird story about monsters and two black kids going into a magical jungle right now. And he said, I think you're wrong. And I think that, you know, we should do it. I believe in you and I believe in the story. Um, that lesson, the lesson there is um, you never know how much power a simple kind word can have for someone. I was ready to completely throw, you know, throw in the towel and say, this is not, this is not meant to be. And just by saying, I believe in you and I believe in the story, that's what made me say, okay, let's, let's give it a try. Um, so we took the story out last summer and um, publishing is slow. It's notoriously slow, even when it's fast, it's slow. Um, and, you know, we sent it out on Thursday. By Monday, uh, we heard from a publisher that said, I want to take it to acquisitions, which is the next step in publishing. If an editor likes it, they can take it to an acquisitions team to determine how much you want to offer for the, this book or books. Um, and then it kind of snowballed. And it went from this very slow four-year process to getting to talk to editors from publishing houses that I'm like, wait, as in the one that I see on my grandma's in my grandma's library, like on the spines, like the you know. Um, and it was it was surreal. Um, and then kind of, yeah, the snowball gets bigger and it it, it went from there and, and kind of now I feel like I'm in the snowball just rolling <laughs> my legs and arms sticking out. Um, I Beast of Cray was meant to come out next year. Um, they bumped it, they being Penguin Young Readers, my publisher bumped it up. Um, and it came out this September. So that's that's the journey, and it's it's a long one, but I guess um along the way, I I, I guess I really want to be honest about a how long it took, how hard it was. I did get agents who rejected the story when I sent it to them, who said, Oh, I don't think you're Black boy character is strong enough. And I thought, hmm, I don't think you understand. And I, I can accept criticism, but I'm like, if, I, I wanted to write a story where, you know, black boys didn't have to be strong. And that was the point. Because I have a little brother who, I know I, I, he's not here, so he can't be embarrassed by it, but he's 6'1 <laughs> he's and like this football coach and this big guy now. But when I think about him, um, I think about a little boy in Thomas the Tank Engine overalls because that was my little brother. And I saw, um, you know, how he was as a kid and how he was received when he went to school and how what teachers expected of him and the assumptions they made about him. He was too much in his seat. He asked for water too much, things that are really not consequential. Um, and I, I wanted to write a story for boys like him, you know, boys that weren't always 
you know, in the mud fighting and, and, and this and that, but just, you know, we're happy to do a puzzle, happy to play with the Thomas the Tank Engine train. Um, I didn't see stories like that. I didn't see stories like that for my little brother. And so when that particular agent said, you know, your, your black main character is not strong enough, I said, okay. Um, but it did hurt. And that was not the only rejection. So there was lots of rejection along the way. There were editors. When um, Pete and I were submitting the work to different editors who said, this isn't for me. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't grab me. Um, even now, one weird thing that's happening is my art is now out in the world. Um, and being a writer and being an author are different things. Um, being a writer, my job is to tell stories. Being an author, my job is to um, write stories, but also promote and sell a thing, a product, which means that people are free to criticize the product. And it's a strange thing because um, that's a piece of me that is now up for public criticism forever. No parent involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and again, I, come, I told you all, I would go all over the place. Um, but I really, what I wanted to emphasize probably more than anything um, is that I wrote these to pray that, you know, I'm hesitant to say there was a theme or a thing I wanted to drive home about it. I don't think that's my job to do that, but I wrote it, you know, to tell myself it's the 17 year old version of myself, um, you know, running from the things that scare you, the things that stress you out, the things that make you panic. Um, doesn't actually make them go away. You have to face them. Kofi and Ekon, the two main characters in the story, these are two kids who come from different walks of life, who are, you know, their goal is to go into this magical jungle and find a monster and hunt it down. But they're also running from monsters internally. They're running from grief. They're running from trauma. They're running from anger, from sadness, from disappointment. And they're not dealing with it. And as a result, these monsters are growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's not until they turn and they stop and they face and they unearth these things they've buried that they heal. Um, and so, you know, I, I know in college, undergrad, this was probably the most stressful uh, period of my life. I'm, I'm 28, so a fifth of my life has been spent here. Um, and I love Fayetteville and I love the University of Arkansas, but I remember so acutely the terror and the fear and the pressure of every decision I make is going to change my life. If I decide to take this class, you know, I won't have a third child. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, it's ridiculous, right? But but I felt that that kind of pressure. If I don't get an A in this class, I, I won't do this, which will cause me to do this, which will cause me to have a horrible thing happen to me when I'm 42, whatever. Um, and in the end, I, I wish that I hadn't felt that way. I wish I had, I wish, and I had so many wonderful mentors, this is not their fault, but I wish I could have like stepped into my in, into the past and told myself, you're gonna be okay. And you will screw up and you will mess up and you will make the wrong choice. You will probably, you will, you will fail a test. It's okay. It's not life ending. You will stumble, you will fall, but there's a bigger purpose. And you, even when you find that purpose, you will continue to stumble and fall and mess up. Don't run from the things that scare you. You know, turn, face them, address them, take them on. They're not as scary as you, as you were probably thinking they are. Um, Gosh, I think that's, I could go on and on, but <laughs> that's, that's what I hope, I hope to do, you know, especially for the undergraduates that are here, I cannot drive that home enough. Um, enjoy your time. You don't ever, ever, ever have, I mean, even if you go to grad school, you never do undergrad again. It's, it's special. The ability to have your peers and have friends who are your age going through what you're going through. You'll never have quite that experience again. You'll never have that safety of being on campus and knowing your way around and, and having that safety net to fail. You can fail when you're older, but it's, it's, it's different. You have you know, spouses and children and houses and taxes and horrible <laughs> things like that <laughs> um, to contend with. So just please enjoy your time. Speak with your professors. Ask and talk to them after your class. Ask every question um, and don't be afraid. <laughs> Fabulous advice being an underdog. Man, I remember those words. <laughs> yes. Um, Ayana is happy to take some questions before we retire for a lovely reception. So, 
Anyway, I'll just go ahead and let you feel them. So ask away, y'all. This is kind of a specific, like, technical question for writing, um, but it's something I struggle with. I want to hear insight. How? What are your methods of going about writing, like, compelling and realistic dialogue? You know, stuff that actually sounds good. And, okay, so we've reached the point of this where I start to sound like a delusional person. Um, I read to myself aloud, and sometimes I don't. You know, what speech tags said, like, "Don't do this," she said. I don't read the she said part. I just read the actual dialogue to myself as if I'm hearing a conversation. I'll sometimes record myself, listen and see, does that sound, does that sound authentic? Does that sound stilted? Does that sound stiff? Um, obviously sharing with critique partners, getting objective perspectives. And this goes for academic writing or you know, nonfiction and fiction writing. I think getting as many eyes on it as possible. But for dialogue, that's, I mean, I really, I, I just read it to myself and listen. Hearing it is different than reading it. I don't know if that helps. That's a, that's a great answer. Yeah. This is kind of like a curiosity thing because I'm also a reader, but I was wondering if you had like a favorite book or like a series that you would say like inspired you while writing? While writing Beasts of Prey or writing in general? Just writing in general. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I have like, do you, what genre do you have? Um, you mentioned like magic and stuff, so like you have yeah. any favorite like fantasy? Fantasy? Um, yeah, and that's that's a really good question, but it's a, it's a tricky question. And this is, this is an interesting thing about books. So I refuse personally, I don't, I told you I'm really honest and I'm not going to retcon my childhood. Um, I read, you know, I read Chronicles of Narnia and I loved Chronicles of Narnia. I also read Harry Potter and that's a hard thing. It's, it's a hard thing for me to say now because the author of those books has massively failed careers, in my opinion, and, and I'm disappointed in her. But I did read those books and um, they were a massive part of my childhood. Um, so I did read those. I read Aragon. So, you know, I read Percy Jackson. Um, there's a lot of young adult fantasy uh, authors who I adore. So that to hear who wrote Number in the Ashes, Matt Quartet, um, is, is amazing. But then, you know, and that's fantasy. But I also read Toni Morrison in high school. And that was the first time I ever, ever really got to read any black author in school. And that was an independent reading assignment. That was not even mandated by my teachers. Um, and just reading about blackness in a way that I'd never seen, and reading about people who looked like me for the first time and reading about them in a positive light it made me realize I, I could do it too. So those are some, some of the authors, but I mean, I could literally list off for three hours because <laughs> yeah. I have books. Yeah. Uh, Really love your talk. This is amazing. Really confirming a lot of really cool things. Um, Toni Morrison was a first for me too, and I was stubborn to not read the books in high school. Um, I guess the canon black books in high school because you had Walter D. Myers about kids who you know grew up strangely a different way than I did, even though they looked like me. So I avoided them, and then you had the adult ones like. Again, like Honey Morrison, that were you know really serious and stuff, but I was too scared at first until I got to maybe college, and then like uh, Dr. Which is still here, Dr. Hancock gave me the book. <laughs> but um, you mentioned that you were in a story, which and how did you find time to write? Which one were it was it? And how did you find time to write? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, hmm? Oh, this is a time management question. Mm, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, so which sorority, I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Um, and um, time management, I didn't sleep. No, I'm just kidding. I, the, my uh, friends have a long standing joke because I collected the rock star energy drinks that I was, that I would drink. And um, one day I was walking down Garland Avenue at two o'clock in the morning, walking from Mullins. I should not have been out by myself that late. My mom, never mind. Uh, she never knew, so it was fine. But I remember I was walking and my heart just started to randomly run <laughs> pattern. And I was like, okay, no more rocks starting to drink, so I'm done. Um, but I, I, and I didn't sleep, and I don't recommend that. You know, you, you have to choose what's important to you, and it's okay not to choose everything all the time. So I was writing, you know, during my spare time. There wasn't a whole lot of it. Um, and it wasn't until after I really, honestly, until after I finished college and my time sort of changed where I had a job that ended at five o'clock where I could focus on writing. And it was a part, it was a second job, especially when I was in Gainesville, Florida. 
Um, I get home from my day job at five, eat dinner very quickly, work from six to 10 every night and then all weekend long. And I think that's worth saying too. Um, nothing in life worth anything comes easy. If you want something to be your dream job, you have to treat it like a job. I believe that. And so putting in the hours even when you're not getting paid. Um, and I gave up, you know, seeing friends and parties and, and kind of stuff I wanted to do. But it was because I, at that, at that point in 2018, I was like, okay, I want to be an author. This is what it takes. So I wish I had a better answer about how to find that balance, but you, you <laughs> have to do what makes you happy and what, what you love. And I, I love books and I love stories. So. You said that you pulled um, from a lot of your personal experiences. Is there any additional research that you're going to do when writing Beasts of Prey? Mm -hmm. So, and you know, it's because we've taken courses together. We're going to do it together. Um, uh, so, I, because of my degree, I had a, you know, a base knowledge in Pan Africanism and slavery and some of the things that are in Beasts of Prey. There are historical figures that I named characters after. Um, so, I had that knowledge, but I didn't know much about mythology. Uh, specifically in the African continent, mythology is plural. I knew about Greco-Roman mythology, um, and I even wished for Black mythology I didn't know existed. And I had to, you know, I read a lot of anthologies with stories to kind of see what patterns, because Western mythology and Western storytelling is very different than storytelling in other parts of the world. Um, that was hard to do because a lot of the, mythology, the anthologies that I found um, were translated and were you know, rewritten by, by scholars who, who's, um, their, how do I say it? They had maybe sometimes ulterior motive to translating it. They had biases that they had then injected into the story. So I'd be reading it and I'm like, wait a minute, that description doesn't seem, that doesn't seem right. Um, so, but unfortunately that's, that's what I had. And sometimes it was like Google Scholar and JSTOR had articles about, about specifically mythology and stories um, and how they changed depending on what region. You'll find the same story for the same character, the same God in different parts of Africa. Um, and I would kind of take note of that. I love the monsters and finding out about all the creatures um, that I didn't know about because I'm a nerd and I love animals and I love <laughs> monsters. Um, but that was where a lot of the, re the research was because I knew very little about, about mythology in Africa and in different parts of Africa. Um, I would love to know more about your inspiration for your group, specifically the owner of the series. So, <laughs> um, okay, so inspiration for the characters. I want. I feel like this is a trick question um, because okay, so I talked about Ekon being inspired by my little brother partially. Um, the owner, so Kofi, one of the main characters, works at a night zoo. She's actually an indentured servant at a night zoo, and. Um, she and her mother are working to pay off a debt that was incurred by her father. That isn't so complicated family dynamics from the, from the start. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with Beasts of Prey was write a story where you got to see Black people in nuance, in, in different, you know, Black. Someone asked me, were you afraid to write a Black villain? No, I was excited <laughs> because it's cool to write Black people occupying different spaces. And so the owner of the Night Zoo where Kofi works um, is not a nice person. Um, and I wanted to write this, this character that was over the top and fabulous and grand, but also cheap and like just a bit ridiculous. Um, and I pictured him very specifically, and I don't know if I've, I've already said this to you specifically, but um, he was inspired by T-Pain. <laughs> so, um, if you've ever seen T-Pain with giant gold teeth and a chain that says big ass chain, <laughs> um, the top hat that he often wears with his like huge dreadlocks with blonde, huge blonde dreadlocks, just over the top. But it, it was fun. It was getting to write an over the top kind of uh, you know fantastical black man who owned who owned a fantastical zoo. I just thought that was fun. So I don't know if you wanted to specifically <laughs> know about anybody else. I don't think about all of them, but that, I had no idea about you. I didn't know if you really knew. Yeah, um, my I'm my editor. Uh, capital when I told her that um you know Adi and Kofi are two of the other main points of uh, points of view in the story um and I don't know if there was a specific thing that with those two that, I mean I'm a black girl so it was more personal to write them but I wanted to write a one character who um, was dealing with grief 
in a specific way. It's easy to grieve when you lose somebody who you loved and, and, and had a good relationship with. It's a lot harder to grieve someone who you were angry with. And because they're gone and there's unresolved anger there, that's something that I didn't see in fantasy and in young adult fantasy. It's something that I experienced um, and I wanted to write about it. So that's part of what Kobe's inspiration was. I also think that, at least in my experience, um, Black women, Black girls are often encouraged to feel small. You're too loud, you're too this, you're too that. So I wanted to write a character that was very loud and very in your face and very confident and very powerful. And instead of being ashamed of it, was proud of it. I am the best in my class. I, you know, I remember, and I, I'm not, this is not probably exclusive to Black girls, but especially women, there were, there's been so many studies about how when girls raise their hands, they raise them like this, as opposed to like this, because they are unsure. They're like, uh, even when they know the answer, they're afraid of being the best in class because of the stereotypes that come with a girl who knows too much. Um, and so I wanted to write a character that pushed against that and was like, I am the best in my class and I know it. Um, and that's where Adia came from, even though she also has fragility and insecurity because she's also a teenager and teenagers don't know everything. Um, most of the time. Um, so that's, I mean, with that, with those two specifically, it sort of was pieced together with Econ. Um, it was very specific. It was, that was from my cool brother. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. It was great. Um, you talked a lot about how the story is like a piece of you and how it's out in the world and people are critiquing it. How did you go about dealing with that? Like separating kind of like yourself, like putting a barrier between like the critique and the fact that like the story is a piece of you. The brutally honest answer. Sure. Yeah. The block button. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. I, okay. So I, I there's something called Goodreads um, that is a lot of readers use to collect. They they have lists. On, it's kind of like a social media specifically for books. So I block myself from looking at um, my own books pages. Um, Rick Riordan who wrote Percy Jackson. One day, somebody tweeted at him and asked if two characters in the story were gay. And I'm paraphrasing what he said, but I thought it was brilliant. He said, basically, the relationship that a reader has with the book is none of the author's business. And, and I thought that was brilliant because the truth is, you know, it's not. It's not my business what people take from Beasts of Prey. I wrote it on September 20th and put it out into the world, and it's, it's there to be critiqued. Some people, like, I've had people reach out, and Econ has OCD. He's a character has OCD. And there are people who have OCD who've written me, like, that was the most important part of the story for them, because I have OCD. Um, I've had, care, you know, readers from various countries in Africa who reached out and said, I've not gotten to see this in this particular, you mentioned Kwame Nkrumah, who was a major leader in Pan-Africanism. And that reference meant a lot to me. Um, and so people will take different things from it, and that's okay. And it's, it's really, I appreciate when people tell me, but I also understand it's not really my business. I, I put it out there, and I'm at peace with that. And so it's blocking myself. <laughs> a lot of times it's blocking myself and, and giving myself distance, especially right now because it's all pretty new. But also when people are, um, when people are malicious, um, this is hard for me because I'm from the South and it's yes, ma'am, and, and saying yes to everything. But it's also protecting my, my mental health and, and putting barriers up so that people can't attack me personally. They're free to have the opinion by all means, but like ta getting tagged in things so that, you know, come look at this horrible thing that I've said about you. Mm -hmm. It's realizing like I don't have to look. I can create those boundaries for myself and my mental health so that I don't have to see them and, and engage with them. That's not my job as a writer. My job is to tell the story, so it's still a work in progress. I still literally use the block button. <laughs> Thank you. One final question, Professor Shrekheis. I saw your hand. Yeah, you mentioned animals before. Uh, there are a lot of heads of some animals that make sense going on the heads of other animals. Yeah. But an elephant on the head of a snake, where did you come up with and why is it so disturbing? <laughs> it's my favorite creature. I didn't come up with it. Um, so what Dr. Sharkas is referring to is um, a mythical creature called root slang. Um, root slangs come from Zulu lore. Zulu, Zulu people um, are in South, South Africa. 
Um, and this is what I mean about finding mythology. Like we know about Pegasus, right? We know about fairies, we know about wars, we know about a lot of Eurocentric mythical beings and creatures. But I learned about root slums and was like, this is really terrifying and cool. <laughs> so it's like the head of an elephant with the body of a snake and it hoards jewels and it's this creepy, horrible thing. Um, but I thought it was fun. And, and I noticed a lot of times within different African mythologies, it's often animal A meets animal B smashed together in a really terrifying way. That's just something that you see a lot of times. Um, you see a lot of foolish, the foolish woman and the man had to come save her from being eaten by said creature or by the children being, being eaten by said creature. These, the stories don't usually end well, mostly <laughs> tragic. Um, that's a long way to answer, but I, I didn't come up with it. And that's the cool thing. Like, as a little kid, I remember reading stories and thinking that authors came up with all this themselves and then learning later, they actually borrowed from mythos, you know, from different places. And that encouraged me to want to learn and to dig into kind of these rabbit holes and discover for myself. So it's really, I have like an author's note at the end that kind of talks about some of the mythical creatures, but the hope is that, you know, someone else is like, ooh, this creature sounds horrifying and then they google and, and you know it starts they start to learn about other mythologies that they wouldn't have gotten to learn about perhaps if they hadn't read so great all right let's go by We are going to retire to a fantastic reception at 1.30. That's our Honors College First Floor Lounge. But before I do, I want to give a couple of other thanks in the room. And this is I'm turning my attention to the Honors College crew. Of course, we've had many people behind the scenes. Uh, Kendall Curley, our Director of Communication, um, negotiator for a lot of this. Um, also, Autumn. Louis Spicer in the back, our director of development, who's been uh, massively involved in this entire thing. My wizard and IT right, left hand, <laughs> Michael Zachary, who's been uh, helping the tech all night. And a special shout out to Heba Tahir, who came to us months and months ago. Um, Heba's finishing her MFA and is quite a poet. And so I've been following Ayana Gray's career. We need to invite her in. So of course, I always do what Heba says. So <laughs> um, a special shout out to Heba to here. And if I've left anybody else off, probably, but you know, who did I leave off? Louise. Louise in the background. <laughs> Louise is our uh, Zoom support. And Ronaldo doesn't ever like me to mention her, so I'm going to. Ronaldo Augustine Robinson. <laughs> Um, we've done a lot of logistics and will provide us with a beautiful reception. So there's awesome food, some libation. So join us and you all can talk to Ayana more individually. So again, that was a great time. Don't run away, go to reception. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. 